Hello and welcome everybody. This is our talk, Plan Your Learnings, Can Friendly User Testing After SOP Become a Common Practice? These are considerations by my colleague Nishiguchi san and by myself, Philip Arman. We are both engineers at Ardit, a form of advanced driver information technology with a joint venture by Robert Bosch GmbH in Germany and Denzo san Denzo Corporation in Japan. We are very happy that we got the chance to talk here at the Automotive Linux Summit. It's our first trial to make a pre-recorded session and I hope you will enjoy and what we have to say today. Let me also not forget to say thanks to all the sponsors of this Automotive Linux Summit, especially also to the Linux Foundation and to the Automotive Grade Linux project. At the beginning of the presentation, let me first of all give you an idea on how this whole talk is structured. I split this talk in three major groups. The first one is called the base, where the basic ideas of IVI systems is presented, how software for IVI system looks like, then how safety issues are still treated today, and how both of them are influenced by updates getting into the toolbox, into the common sense. The second part is the change area. It tells you a little bit on how nowadays cars get connected, how influence into the automotive market can get over from other industries like the web service industry or also mobile industry. And this will have impact on how our products look into the future. So for this, the consequence, the third part will start with giving you an idea on triggered learnings, validated learnings, a first use case on how to provide log information, and then a very detailed view on the ELISA project use case of telltale handling in a Linux-based cluster. At the end, we will give a summary and have hopefully some room for discussions. But first, let us have a few words on who we are. As said in the beginning, my name is Philipp Armann. I'm currently manager at the Ardip GmbH, the German entity of the Ardip Corporation. And as said, it's a joint venture company of Robert Bosch GmbH and Denso Corporation in Japan. In the last five years, my main work was in the field of project leader before I had three years as a test team lead. Also, I spent four years as hardware and software engineer. This provides me with an overall experience for more than 12 years in the field of automotive. And yeah, taking my time before I joined Ardit, also a lot of Linux expertise from university and so on, which gives me overall 15 years in this area. Since last year and the very beginning, I'm also active member of the ELISA project, which also influenced a little bit the talk here today. And I'm former member of AutoSign Green Arrow. Additionally, I'm an open source enthusiast. I try to use open source wherever possible. And yeah, due to my background and the many years with Ardit, I really love Japan. And as I'm always interested in new technologies and methodologies, I get to know Kaizen. And I believe this also influenced the talk here today a bit. Now I want to hand over to my colleague Nishiguchi-san so that he also gets a chance to introduce himself. Thank you, Philip. Uh, hello, let me introduce by myself. I'm Nanfiro Nishiguchi belonging to the ADAT Corporation at Japan. And uh, currently I'm working on Linux Project Leader. So far, I have developed IVI system, especially audio part from low layer, like a sound driver to upper layer, like a UI application. Through such a development, I spent 12 years as a developer, two years as an architect. And uh, some part of myself is uh, still architect in ADAT Japan site. 
I have been in the automotive industry for about uh, 14 years, uh, developing on Linux for about uh, eight years. And recently, I'm working for the functional process adaptation in AJT. Now, I'm a AGL automotive grade Linux and a ERISA member. Okay, then I will hand over to Philip again. Okay, so then let's uh, start our journey. So the base of our journey will be to get the knowledge on how IPI systems typically still look like, also how recent ECUs in the field of safety fit in and also how updates after SOP have influenced these products a lot. As I bring a lot of experience from the field of in-vehicle infotainment, so IVI products, I always had the impression that we treat these products really in the same way as we treat engine or brake systems. So we have a very heavy process, we spend all effort with highest quality and all possible uh, measures to reach the point where we have no reset, no freeze, full stability and we got rid of any kind of issues. Of course, this yeah, way towards perfection is needed because the car should work properly until the end of the lifetime. And this can be 10 or more years, much more than a smartphone would give us or yeah, television software. And also here we are already used to see resets. An IVI product should not reset. And nevertheless, it could happen because although we target perfection, we never be perfect completely. To give you an example, I observed the first reset where I see that the IV system turned off and on again only six years after operation. And funny enough, a week after I experienced it again and after this no longer. And it was totally clear that this reset was there but I never reported so never an engineer will get the feeling that there was something wrong, something could be missed and something which could be improved for the future. So I think it's valid to ask the question, how many more perfect IVI systems will be out there on the street having a reset and no engineer will ever get to know it? And even if we just think about perfection in an IVI system, we have even stronger demands, of course, in functional safe operation or safety ECUs. Here, the safety and integrity standards already tells us that the system is functionally safe, maybe not intrinsically safe, and even the standard will be argued that we do not expect failures, as we took all possible failure measures with safe state and other options. The strict process with a lot of evidences also assume that there no failure can happen. But can we really say that these assumptions are still correct? The world is getting more complex. So in the past there were split ECUs and nowadays these ECUs get centralized. A bare metal software stack with a thousand lines of code suddenly gets into AutoSAR from AutoSAR to AutoSAR Adaptive and may end up in a full Linux stack. We use hypervisors, OS cells, containers, much more than the traditional Arches. And this is really a change to what happened in the last years. Nevertheless, a safety standard or safety integrity standard still treat these products in the same way. I also wanted to give an example outside of the IVI or outside the automotive world which shows how small design flaws can make a fundamental change. 
So Boeing wanted to be competitive with Airbus when bringing in the 737 MAX series. They followed their processes, they made considerations, but there was a little piece which didn't behave expected and really caused a lot of incidents and even if a standard is followed, even if complexity is treated and even if perfection was also in mind. So this is something also where updates were needed and just these days after a long time Boeing was able to um, get the information and to get an update and let the Boeing 737 MAX fly again. Another part, even if you had functional safety you still may have connected ECUs, you may have still access and here I wanted to give an example on a newspaper article which says that hackers found ways to exploit automotive software and were able to overtake cars. So this means uh, security updates are necessary because security exploit, exploits may force OTA updates of cars, especially for connected ECUs, as I just said. There are much more ideas where you can have field updates. So uh, one part where I read their long way, and it was a nice article from Hyundai, how they enabled update over the air to bring in new functionality for being able to deliver security updates. There's also the demand for it. And yeah, but also if you are not doing and you have a connected car, you can see this from uh, TechCrunch. There have been bugs in there that uh, let hackers remotely control a Mercedes-Benz car. More a positive example is uh, what a hacker could find in the software. So this hacker was not actually hacking a full car for doing harm, but he was looking into what he could s get as information out of the car. And Tesla was uh, providing hints that they introduced 5G hotspot software update parts in their latest software. So this gives you an idea and a summary on the update after SAP section and how this influence our modern connected uh, devices, centralized ECUs. Of course the one top item are the security vulnerabilities. These should be there in no time and much faster and it may not be sufficient to go into workshop anymore to get a regular software update. Operating system updates are another field. So there could be someone forcing you to do an update. There could be something that you just want to address new functionality. Uh, you want to have, for example, some bug fixes in which were not crucial issues, but you figure out that the user experience is much more relieved and improved. Yeah, and of course, one traditional part is always a map update. I guess this is something which 10 years back you may have done with a CD or DVD, then later on maybe by USB storage or SD card storage. And recently you most likely connect the ECU and may be able to update over the air. And this is an update of your device after SAP. And even if you have checked carefully, you don't know if new issues come up. Yeah, the last part of course would be the most brilliant one when you really want to deliver new features. As we could just the slide back on what Tesla did where they introduced a new feature on 5G hotspot by a software which is not usable yet but still already deployed. So this also brings us directly to the second part I we say what's the change which comes in where nowadays cars get connected and where we should also take a glimpse to other industries the other industries which we focus on are web services and mobile industries. So let's get a look into this. I saw what's very nice to look at is uh, what we already find in the car. Emergency location services or e-call is something most of you will most likely know in case you have a crash so there is a call and this call will go to service center and uh, 
they will ask if everything is fine and due to the location services they know where you are so even if you are not torque they can inform the ambulance or other parts. This works already with the mobile connection so there need to be a modem in there which can call. This directly goes along with data plans and if you already have a data plan maybe you think about apps and connected apps is nothing new. I put here a link to if you scan the QR code uh, what it's, I worked on in 2014, so six years back, was our first connected product. Yeah, and from connected apps, it's a um, next step to also provide the chance to install apps. So you go for the app stores, which you can also find in the first cars. Then, if you anyway are in the connection fields where you have a Bluetooth connection, you have Wi Fi connection, you have a lot of sensors in the car, it's just natural also to connect to other cars and to the infrastructure. So you have car to car, car to X communication. Uh, you may provide information on uh, traffic signs detected, communicate with other cars, warn you on traffic jams or other. Enhancing this comes with cloud computing and processing, where you really upload data and receive data also during your way in the car. And then as you have the mobile services, as we could see also again with the Tesla bar, uh, there is the Wi-Fi and access points. These can also just be used to share media across the car from a device to the IVI system, from the IVI system to other parts and your devices. So this is also which comes in. And looking into this feature set, uh, it sounds a lot like smartphones. And they also started small, so I took the first smartphone kind of thing where not everybody was talking about smartphone with the Nokia communicator. This was my first experience for something more than a feature phone back in 1996. I was really impressed to see this what I called more a computer at this time in a pocket size format. And then it took a longer way until we really became to something which is called smartphone. And well the first iPhone where Apple calls itself that Apple reinvented the phone in 2008 was more of an most er, and best iPod ever seen, they really made it true that they said this is only the beginning. And what a phone involved over the time, you can see when you just think that you may have taken up your uh, smartphone and just checked the QR code which is up there. Here, I didn't want to spend much more on uh, the parts how cars get connected. I once more want to stress we cannot deny field updates of the car. We have cars already connected and much heavier data exchange will come over the air. And as I said we should take a look and glimpse to other industries. They have a much better way already today in dealing with updates and also how they plan their learnings. I took a very minimal slide, but uh, I found it impressive enough to explain a little bit about the web services and how things get in there, especially because you typically don't even see this. One feature which I really love is this split or A-B testing. So um, basic of concept of this is to make a change for example to web page and some users will see what's rendered web page and the other users will see a slightly different web page. So I put a link here also so that you can read a little bit more afterwards. The basic idea here was uh, you say comparing click rates. So here the green icon uh, was giving much more clicks with 72% compared to just the blue learn more with 52%. This is also uh, related to micro changes, faster iterations, and before making a full user interface with all the configurations and so on. So before you bring your product to perfection, you start your learnings. So you come with an idea on your feature, you bring this micro feature in, and you already try it you know, with a friendly user testing or a very limited number of customers. Then also to get hidden features in, it's not really hidden features, it's some software residing on a server 
but it can also be operated, it can operate in the background so you don't see it and just at a certain point of time if you gained a lot of confidence that it's not causing any other side effect on the system you put it live, you make it go live and here I guess that's a little bit also how uh, Hacker found the Tesla 5G thing. It's not a web service but most likely Tesla has learned from this. The next slide I get into the mobile industry and here I also spent only one major slide so uh, what do we see there? Mobile industry is much more familiar to most of us. We know about beta testing. Uh, you can, for example, sign up and make your Pixel phone a beta phone. Uh, you see that stability is already quite good at an early point of time. And you can also use beta test to be here on the tip when it comes to app development by migrating an Android version. So this is all the learning and the ideas to just speed up development. You get feedback from uh, users in an early state, you help them to develop new things and you can make your product better. Then uh, the simpler way without active participation or signing up by users is just feedback requests. This can be for example just the ratings, uh, I put one screenshots here on how the call quality is. You may see this on a lot of your services which you also operate where you work with tools and um, it's very similar to also rating system where you say yeah this app is good so you look into crash reports which coming in and you can also provide surveys and for us I guess this part is getting normal and here's thinking on how normal this is on your car so I never heard about someone who was offering beta testing to users within the car where you just said well you know you want to get the beta of this or uh, how was the call quality? I want to update this one in the car. Also, it's seldom that you can rate this product because they come with your car. It will be more indirect uh, yeah, reviews or something like this. One news part which I also wanted to bring is from 925 Google. This I found quite interesting to read was um, that also developers should disclose crash reports and that they also inform the users so that if you're not doing a proper way of crash reports and bringing this in and also providing this back to Google to a certain extent, you may be even removed from Play Store. So you can see that here uh, crash reports is a fundamental part of the work. That may also mean that Android gets very strong. And yeah, talking about Android, Android is also entering the automotive market. So mobile industry took its chance, took its knowledge from all the smartphones and tried to get into new market with automotive. So these new players enter the car and I took a screenshot here or a picture from uh, the Polestar. The Polestar 2 maybe, I'm not sure. This includes Android at the first corporation by Google where they also bring a full Android stack in there. This hopefully doesn't sound surprising. I think a lot more Android uh, products are ramping up here. And here, I'm not sure if uh, Google planned their learnings, but they got a lot of experience upfront. So um, taking a long way back, five to six years, we see that uh, Android entered the car already with Android Auto. And I think this is something which we all integrated with our IVI products. So CarPlay, Android Auto are used in a lot of products. It already provides an entry device or smaller device, also higher premium devices with uh, Google look and feel, usage of apps. And it already enables people to see Android devices on their IVI system even if there is an underlying uh, other OS and it makes them used to expect also an Android in their car. So if you are these days surprised how strong Android grows, you may have considered this also four or five years back when the first Android Auto was getting in to market. Yeah. 
I made a statement here also in this I said which learnings have been planned since this announcement so have you prepared to see this uh, change of Android what Android means to your products how you can compete how your software will compete also what infrastructure Android brings what demands will come and if you haven't done maybe now would be a good time to also say what are your assumptions on how the story will go on and how to prove these assumptions yeah, now we successfully covered the base part, the changes which we see to the base of products and we can enter the consequence, which is the details on the learnings which we can trigger and how we sh should share the learnings which we gain to remain competitive. And here this also include the part where we got the main idea from and this was actually not from uh, the traditional software product but from a completely different market so planned learning or also validated learning is a strong element in the book the lean startup by eric Ries. it's very interesting because it gives you an idea how to get faster products and that whenever you take business, so not software, but business, that's why I said it's different uh, area where the idea comes from is that you shouldn't wait until you learned something by the hard way at the end. It's basically often taken as a good story into something where you want to hide your failures. So from failure in this case means from what you originally considered uh, as a good product where you never saw that it may fail. And typically you just do a post-mortem analysis, so you wait until something uh, happened, you were surprised, and they say, yeah, but at least we learned something out of it. And here you should trigger and see that you made progress, that you validate whatever your learnings you plan. And I think this becomes a little bit more obvious when we go to further use cases. But before we can look into use case, we should first of all see which levels of information and uh, friendly potential friendly user testing exists. The most obvious one with the lowest impact to a product with not even being connected can be the inspection during workshop. So if you don't want to spend a modem into your car, you can still uh, read error memory information that you can just put some base logs in there and I think this is just common. So here you could collect data and inform that this should be forwarded from the workshop to the OE down the road to the BSP developer. If you don't want to wait for the workshop, you could give it a try with a QR code. You see, you've seen two or three already in this presentation and I guess you're so much used to QR code scanning so this could be something which you can also place into an IVI system and just say, well, I found this bug, here's the code, scan it and get in log information. Then you could also consider direct communication if you already have a modem in there, a data plan. So you could use some bytes of this data plan to have even seamless upload of logs without user interaction. Uh, if things are hidden, this may not always be the thing which uh, people like. So for this, it may be worse to ask also for approval so that people become active participants in this and are really friendly users testing because they signed to be there. And last part in this area is also to ex respect data privacy statements and uh, data privacy of some certain countries. I know Germany is very strict on data privacy. A lot of rules apply here, so be careful in what information you upload and what profiles you create if you don't ask uh, users for their acceptance on this. And yeah, one important part is also this all implies that there's something where you need to learn. And this says your product is not perfect, as we may have seen it in the first slides. So we need to get a culture to say we still target to make a product as good before, but we should accept an imperfect world. And here some way to accept imperfect world would be to 
and also try features for free. If you don't pay for something, your acceptance on smaller issues may be much higher than if you paid a lot of money for it. Um, another way how to motivate people could also be that you ask for surveys and to have a motivation in there is that you can win a voucher. It could be something small like, uh, like a cap or just some stickers or you get a car cleaning voucher or something like this. And last element here is also to see if we saw the Android Auto getting into the car, if we see how people are used to certain elements, maybe IVI system will on the long run anyway be much more similar to smartphones than uh, to a brake or engine control. All this said, I guess it's time to rephrase our initial fire and forget policy and perfection at its point of release. I guess before SOP, IVI products will no longer be treated as engine and brake systems. So we can rephrase it maybe to IVI products can be more seen as an A spice level phone. And I guess we still will dedicate our efforts to perfection until SOP. But now, as we know, updates will come in. We will not stop there. But as we have the connected cars, we also want to come overcome the last parts, which we say uh, in the no idea on when the reset happens. So we should change the last statement in here and say, we plan our learnings to figure out the cause of the issues, for example, resets, and are able to receive logs. However, in order to be able to receive logs, we will need a fundamental change in the way we collaborate and the way we share information. And this is a part not about trigger learnings, but really to share them. So we should make data available along the line. Meaning if we have an OE, the information should not remain there issue logs, trace logs and information which can be there should go for service provider centrally stored and then be forwarded for issue analysis and user preference analysis and so on. So all these potential learnings you can make, A-B testing and others to the respective supplier or whoever will need it. I want to show it to you in the field of a Linux product, also in the next slide. So if we take this car from before, there will be four main elements. Uh, I come more from the lowest layer. I am embedded guy originally, so I see a BSP is very important. And I know we are trying to build platforms. We try to use the kernel wherever we can uh, to be the same for multiple products, for multiple releases, and to maybe migrate to a new version, but take our learnings from one generation to the other. Similar we would do with middleware updates, would say basically the Octo layer, and we take also here update after update, and it's more a reuse and a completely new development from one generation to the other. So this means potential issues which we find in one generation may be a learning for the next one. Also technologies like USB and uh, smartphone elements will not change too much. Of course, a smartphone itself, yes, but the interface is how they're used, not. So this may also help you for one generation to the other. Here, this is typically maybe with already with two teams. So the embedded guy, the base platform team, not being directly the same one as the ones working really on the BSP. The BSP may also come from Silicon vendor. And then we are at a tier one project team which will take a base platform and develop the first applications on top. So here if a third party involved and it could even be different suppliers, different yeah, tier ones and so on. The full product will end up at the OE with a lot of customizations. Maybe some of them will also be the product team, but at least the final product will get out on the OE side with a full customization. And the OE is also the one who will receive the log information if any 
even the debug message which we build in or so. So it's good that we have them. We could just figure out things before SOP, but we need to get away how the logs will end up here with the embedded guys because they also take a lot of work and stability and the learnings. So this said, I want to conclude my part. You got a good view on how products have to change, uh, what demands we put to car connection, that maybe we reach a point of time where information is available in a collaborative style from OE down to the SOC vendor and how important this could be will be explained a little more in the last part of the presentation which Nichiguchi san will take over here and explain you for the Lisa use case. About the next, uh, let me explain example of a Linux based safety product. The ELISA community and the Asia community are currently collaborating on the realization of the instrument cluster on pure Linux. Uh, this collaboration is discussed in the ELISA automotive working group. In this session, I will use the materials shown on this page, uh, which were used at the September 2020 ELISA workshop. Both materials can be found at the uh, links, uh, so if you are interested, uh, could you please refer to them from this link. At first, I would briefly explain the use case in instrument cluster. A telltale is a lamp, typically found on the instrument panel of the vehicle, as shown in the picture in right-hand side. Such lamp warns of the sheet belt non-use, uh, doors open, lack of engine oil and uh, gasoline, and so on. And Elisa Telltale has the following characteristics. It's not extremely safety critical. Uh, typically, uh, Telltale is A through B in ISO 26262 terms. Timing requirements are not as severe as with engine control software. Uh, it's interesting content for tier one and the OEMs and an opportunity to cooperate between the ELISA and the AGL. And the uh, AGL has a reference hardware and a telltale demonstration software. Uh, these can be used as a starting point of discussion and uh, activity in ELISA. And then, I'd like to talk about the original architecture design of the AGL Tertel. Here is an expert of the AGL architecture design. Functional safety and uh, non-functional safety are isolated by the hardware. The blue part on the left is achieved on the non-safety side using Linux. The green part on the right side is on the safety side using the uh, RTOS. On the Linux side, the Teltero is drawn based on the status or information of the other ECUs received via the can communication and uh, this is monitored on the safety side. If the safety monitor uh, detects an abnormality in the telltale graphic part in the screen, it is processed to shift to a safety state. Uh, this safety state is depend on the OEM uh, specification. Uh, for the fundamental understanding the essence of the uh, Telltale system, here is a diagram with only what is necessary for essence. Again, uh, the design concept of the system is to check and monitor the drawing on the unsafe Linux site for any 
anomalies by the safety side. In summary, uh, the setups of the AGLs are here. Linux will do a lot of rendering and the typical workloads. This typical work includes uh, general IBI system features such as uh, navigation guidance, music playback, and uh, CarPlay or Android out, as well as a uh, meter drawing. Linux is treated as uh, unsafe, uh, but general quality assurance and uh, product development is uh, carried out. Currently, uh, there is no proven use or safety argumentation for Linux, at least in the automotive world. Therefore, a system requires a safety monitor at the outside of Linux to accomplish ACL qualification. The safety monitor is based on the ACL qualified RTOS, running in a functional safety context and we will check that the uh, uh, Linux results are correct or consistent. Finally, in case the safety monitor identifies an improper behavior, safety monitor or safety side software will uh, take over and uh, continue rendering or it will bring the system in a safe state. Now, I'd like to look back on the introduction once. We talked about how IBI and other in vehicle systems are currently being treated to be perfect, as described here. As mentioned before, uh, perfection means that uh, nothing happened to any issue. If uh, this can be realized, a safety monitor is not required. But uh, there are other uses for the safety monitor. Our learning activities as preparation for the next generation product include the following things. As per our assumption and as per our ART quality level, in case that the Linux implementation works correctly, safety monitor will never be triggered for a long renderer image. This information needs to be captured and processed as a learning information. Information on when the safety monitor has been triggered or how long it has not been triggered can be collected by OEMs and uh, suppliers via the cloud. It can indicate or demonstrate how stable the Linux system is. This is a learning that can be applied to the next product development and that this is a seed for the improvement. The concept is a very simple, but unfortunately the real world is much more complex. So the following should be considered. In case that the safety monitor detects failure or abnormal, maybe Linux side cannot be credible. Therefore, RTOS side could store error logs in non-volatile memory in RTOS side. After a system moved to safe state, RTOS read logs and send it to Linux side. Sometimes Linux side was restarted in order to move safe state. At that time, Linux side can credible uh, because of safe state. Then Linux can store logs from RTOS site and was sent to cloud. But uh, there are some problems, risks, or questions. First point is about uh, how do we send the data from RTOS to Linux while keeping RTOS is safe. Depending on the mechanism, we may not be able to keep the safety. To increase the robustness of RTOS site, it is a communication uh, better in one direction. 
This means that the RTOS to Linux only. But in this case, it may not be possible to receive logs correctly. It depends on the state of the Linux. Uh, finally, I will explain the summary. Key messages and uh, takeaways from this session are shown this slide. At first, cards are becoming connected. It's not just for the end user and the customer feature, but also for issue analysis and the new market opportunities by analyzing preferences. And making them more safer, more higher quality, and more secure. Use validated learning to avoid surprises from the field. Automotive industry learns from larger industries such as web services and the mobile phones. Apply the practices even in non-standard areas. It may even enter functional safety use cases. This is the last message from our end. What will be the next learning you want to run up front? If uh, you have any ideas, could you please write it down into chat? Uh, that's all from our presentation. Thank you very much. ありがとうございました。